Good evening, everyone. My name is Melissa Ho, and I'm the museum's curator of 20th century art. Thank you all for joining us for what I know will be a very lively and illuminating discussion of the Washington art scene in the 1960s. The occasion for this conversation is, of course, the exhibition Gene Davis, Hot Beat, on view now on the third floor. Sam is very lucky to be the repository of Davis's work, and we remain grateful to Gene Davis and Flo Davis for their generosity to the museum. Our chief curator, Virginia Mecklenburg, and our emeritus deputy, chief curator, Joanne Moser, selected the works in this stunning presentation of classic Davis stripe paintings, which includes several monumentally scaled canvases that have not been seen in decades. And I want to especially acknowledge here the museum's painting conservator, Amber Kerr, whose phenomenal work ensured that Davis's paintings look their very best uh, for this presentation. The commentaries on the works that you read in the galleries were written by consulting curator Jean Lawler-Cohen, who is also tonight's moderator, and a longtime chronicler of Jean Davis's art and the Washington art scene more broadly. With Sidney Lawrence and Elizabeth Thibault, Jean co-authored the book Washington Art Matters, Art Life in the Capital, 1940 to 1990, which is an indispensable resource for anyone interested in the cultural history of our city. Thank you, Jean, for convening this distinguished group of Washington insiders to share their memories and reflections tonight. Lastly, I'd like to thank those who made this exhibition possible, the Joanne and Richard Brody Exhibitions Endowment, the Jean Davis Memorial Fund, the James F. Dickey Family Endowment, the Tanya and Tom Evans Curatorial Endowment, and Yara's Art of New York, Palm Springs, and Santa Fe. Now, without further ado, I will hand things over to Jean Cohen, who will introduce tonight's panelists. The image that would be good to have up there is the tree of art. All of you have a sheet of that, however, and um, that sheet um, is important to us because in 1967, uh, Washingtonian Magazine, uh, in an article by Cornelia Nolan, who is the ex-wife of Kenneth Nolan, uh, they commissioned this piece. I can't read the artist's name, but uh, it was to in a way, parody the famous 1947 Odd Reinhardt tree of modern art. Uh, it was to say that we needed to get hold of all this information, the sources. Uh, so when you look at it more closely, you're going to see uh, names that will come up throughout this discussion because everybody, even then, was trying to get a sense of the big picture. So that's what we'd like to do tonight. We've tried to talk about it ourselves and see what we could trace through this decade. And uh, at one point, Paul said, the 60s didn't even start in 60. They started in 64, and they went to 74. So uh, a lot happened, and uh, what we think of as traditionally the 60s stars is not the total story. Um, what this does show is the venues, uh, the branches to different things and styles. Uh, but before we start, before I identify these people, I just wanted to be sure that all of you were with us in the 60s. Uh, so the question is, uh, were you alive in the 60s? Raise your hand. Did you look at art in the 60s? Do you remember the 60s? Uh, now, there are people that should stand up, uh, not just raise a hand. Uh, and we don't have light on you, but maybe you can be seen in the Q&A part. But uh, did you make art in the 60s? Stand up, stand up. Yay, okay. Did you show that art in the 60s? <laughs> okay. Who here wrote about art in the 60s? Actually, maybe published, had some words. I think there are some critics here, aren't there? And who sold something in the 60s? <laughs> 
Okay, the panelists here. Uh, we all have a different entry point and perspective on this decade. Uh, ben Forge, the far left there, was at the Star first, 1964 to 81, then went to the Washington Post. And uh, I think his style would be confronting the art directly. Um, and it's like walking, his pieces would be like walking with him through a show in a gallery or museum. And he's good at looking back because he did the afterword for our book, which uh, Melissa mentioned. He did this fine uh, postscript, which we had said, you don't have to do but 500 words, Ben, but it came out to 5,000, I think. So that's crucial to looking at where we are now in, in the history. And uh, then Paul, uh, of course, was at the uh, Washington Post from 1967 to 2001. Nine? Okay, that's wrong in some records. See, that's what happens if you don't have it right. Uh, and he said his experience of the 60s was different from ours because he was single. And he was, he was partying in the artist's social circles. And uh, he was uh, also meeting museum people that he thought were fun in studios and parties. And, and his reviews uh, are different, I think, I've always felt were different because he listened to the artist's intention and then he put his personal spin on it with some poetic language. Um, and Jack Rasmussen is now, of course, director of the Katzen Center, but he's been here doing good things for some time. And he, in 1965, there he is on the lower left. He was a Senate page. <laughs> and he's with Senator Magnuson, what was it, Washington State? A senior senator from the state of Washington. Senior senator. Okay, so you were not a, 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 in the art world at this point. No, well, I'm I'm much younger than the rest of the panelists, but <laughs> so <laughs> but I came out here in the summers uh, in high school, okay. uh, and so I knew Washington a bit, but primarily I lived in California. All right. So in California, though, you had heard of DC art. You were aware of the, what was happening here. Uh, after uh, high school, I went to college and I studied art. I, first, I was interested in politics, of course, and then I became a little bit disillusioned and realized that politics was just a corrupt art form. So I went to, <laughs> went to college and studied art. And uh, we, you know, the artists in, at least in Whitman College in Walla Walla, Washington, we knew about three artists. We knew Sam Gilliam, Joe Shannon, and Gene Davis. Were the how, was that, that how did that happen to be? I don't know. I okay. mean, I... Quite, three quite different artists, too. Right. Okay. Um, so what we've got is an outline with hundreds of names and events and thoughts, and there's no way it's going to have a logical order here in, unless I can uh, keep redirecting it. But uh, if this were a seance, <laughs> there are certain spirits from the past that would come and inform us. But one that's knocking very loudly, and we have to, to go on and get it out of the way, is Clement Greenberg. So I know Paul has some, we all have things to say about this, but Clement Greenberg, as you all know, uh, had an impact here. And the reason he came here was not just the art, but that he had a child here, living here. He was divorced and his, his child lived here. So that brought him physically here. But what, were the, what we, do we have to, how do we deal with Greenberg? Well, let me start by um, telling you the first time I met him. A week before I was named, or started writing about art for the Post, um, it had never occurred to me that I would ever do such a thing. And when it did happen, um, I was invited to have dinner with Mr. Greenberg at the home of Ann Truett and Jim Truett. Jim was a friend of Ben Bradley's and was working at the Post at the time. So I sat at a table with Greenberg and you must understand that this was 1967. This was the year of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And as my wife said, uh, the Beatles changed her life and I was not um, completely unaffected by them either. And I made the mistake in the course of this evening saying, isn't it great in every high school in America there are kids in the basement picking up a bass guitar and a, and a 
guitar and a drum set and writing songs and doing their harmony. And what would it be like in America if that happened to painting? If painting just became such an enthusiasm that, and Greenberg interrupted me and said, Richard, he said, if you're going to try to write about art, the first thing you must do is overcome your Jewish social consciousness. <laughs> he was in many ways a horrible man. <laughs> he was a dictator, an intellectual dictator, a kind of Lenin of the art world. <laughs> he was a man who played favorites, favorites without shame. Gene Davis um, refused to kowtow and was not the kind of guy that flattered people in superior positions. And though initially um, permitted into the inner sanctum, was soon rejected. As far as Greenberg was concerned, Washington had two painters who matter, that was Lewis and Noland. The fact that the best Davis stripe painting is a lot better than the worst Lewis painting never occurred to him. And he had a kind of a grip on intellectual conceptions about art in Washington that is now impossible to kind of imagine because no one has had that kind of power since. And color field painting, he was like the pope of color field painting. He determined the dogma. I asked Ben if he would come up with an art critical summary of what the Greenberg line was. Can we just have it as a capsule so we know what well, the baseline is? It, uh, Greenberg was a brilliant, brilliant uh, writer and critic who evolved into a, uh, as Paul suggested, and I think uh, here in Washington, he sowed a lot of discontent by being exclusionary. And he did so by uh, analyzing art history and basically, uh, if I can sum it up in a way, saying that if you try to have, if you have subject matter in the art, this, uh, that art was kind of a mistake up until uh, the modern period, and that it was a lie to, to have subject matter in your painting. And uh, uh, this was excluding a whole lot. And as Paul suggested... <laughs> the history of art. Yeah. Well, Titian, among others, let's yeah. just say. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, but it was a, uh, this was a, an issue one had to grapple with as a critic. Uh, in D.C. In the, in the 60s, it was the prime issue that you had to grapple with because this uh, was uh, the formalist interpretation had wide uh, uh, effect nationwide. I mean, it was very influential, but in Washington, uh, it had this uh, kind of super impact. And as Paul suggested, uh, that one of the interesting things about this color school when you uh, uh, got to know the practitioners um, was that there was a tremendous amount of bitterness, resentment, confusion uh, among the sort of left outs by the Greenberg dogma. And uh, that was one thing one dealt with and the other was just the intellectual. Uh, it was hard not to be a formalist. I, I studied art in uh, art history in college and uh, uh, everybody was a formalist in a way when you went it and 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 there's nothing wrong with that uh, Titian just to mention another one you look at the formal values you look at color uh, composition placement uh, all of these things which what makes him a great painter but also interpretation subject matter I mean so it's much deeper than that and if you grow up with that I mean, if you love Mondrian uh, and Malevich, but that's not the end of art. So, I mean, Greenberg evolved into uh, a dead end, actually, I thought. And so, and in a been, way, this... He's been the, repudiated the, since. Yeah. I mean, or just, not. A, just withered. Um, I want to say one thing about Greenberg. I thought that as a, as a critic, he was brilliant, as you said, especially early on. But I think, in some way, he did not tell the truth. Um, the argument that 
a line could be drawn and the two or three painters above the line counted and everybody else could be dismissed from a historical sort of metaphysical thing is not truth. He also told, I thought, untruths about history. The most important one for Washington was the myth that Washington color field painting had begun when a young woman in New York, Miss Frankenthaler, who happened at the time to be, have a great deal more money than Clem did. Her father had been a Supreme Court Justice in the state of New York. And she was at the time Clem's gr girlfriend. Um, through Clem, showed her painting, now at the National Gallery, Mountains and Sea, to Leon Berkowitz and Lewis and Nolan. And like Paul on the road to Damascus, they were all blasted by the sign of the stained canvas, and it showed them the path to the future. This story, of course, places Clem Greenberg at the very center of it. Um, what he never talked about, and what must be remembered here, is that Washington had a history before him that shows up in the kind of paintings we see upstairs. One is the L'Enfant Plan, the, just the geometry of the city, the experience of the grid, the experience of the circles, the experience of the Chevron avenues zooming into other. The other was the Phillips Collection, where there was no historical narrative being told. All the paintings were hung by Duncan Phillips in accordance with their color. And the third is just the sunlight of Washington. If you look at paintings from New York of the time, you never see colors like up, upstairs, you see upstairs. You see the silvers and the grays and the blacks. And you see it in John's, you see it in, in Pollock, you see it in de Kooning. And so there was a burst here that felt really sort of planted in the earth of Washington. And Truett called it Parisian the true, light because the, of the say, low skyline. Yeah, what, I'm, what I really think is the true pedigree of Washington color painting comes through Black Mountain where um, Frank and Thaler spent some time and where Nolan studied, where their teacher was Joseph Albers who had taught at the Bauhaus and he do, did geometrical, rigorous, Euclidean, um, quote, contentless paintings where each um, separate panel was filled in in accordance with a geometrical predetermined scheme, one color at a time. And it came, you know, Mondrian, Bauhaus, Albers, Noland. If um, Helen Frankenthaler had never been born, those paintings upstairs could have been made as beautiful as they are today. Okay. I mean, uh, color field painting was a, a move. Washington had a, a spirit to it. Right. Things happened here, but it was part of a wider uh, exactly. environment uh, exactly. so that there were color, through color field painters elsewhere. At, uh, uh, at the same time, not, uh, it was one of the uh, simultaneous kind of uh, discovery. Um, can I just say well, one thing? Well, wait, well, let, yeah. me, let me pick up yeah. on, on one thing you uh, said about D.C. and the light, and I know you mentioned Anne Truitt at Parisian Light. Um, that, I, I agree with you about the influence, the kind of, uh, of living in this city be, with its remarkable plan, and it has a lasting influence on you, and it couldn't help but influence uh, creative spirits who are living in this environment. I know that in, uh, it certainly affected me after living here for some time I'm, and in my travels, I would see other cities and I would think, no, we've got to straighten out this boulevard, <laughs> right. cut down this tree. Right. I mean, to, the actual view, view has a, a lasting effect on one if you live in it day to day. And so I agree a lot with that and I also think the light here is quite extraordinary. If uh, uh, urban geographers and uh, planners talk about the topographic bowl of Washington. The geography of Washington is very interesting in that uh, the lowlands, what is now the center of the city, is really surrounded by a ring of hills. And in the center is the broad of this uh, is the broad Potomac River. And there is an cr incredible effect on cloudy or semi-cloudy days after a rain in particular, uh, from the river and the bowl and the light is quite magical. And I think that in, in a way, 
the color painters, uh, I, I think the magna and the acrylic paint they were using by penetrating the, uh, being absorbed by the canvas itself, uh, had a quality of, of luminescence that in effect uh, 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 reflects this light. It, it is in any way a spiritual uh, kind of connection. Uh, Can I say between, and, and the technique of this and, and the geography and topography of the city. It's hard now when you go upstairs, and these are called classic paintings, to remember how thrilling it was and how new to look into color field paintings. It started in Washington, I think, must, some credit must be given to the Rothko Room at the Phillips. Ben was talking about the moisture and the atmosphere and this peculiar, peculiar quality of the air and light in Washington. Somehow when you looked at a color field painting, it was like looking into kind of open space, peering into an Empyrean kind of beauty that you hadn't seen before. You didn't look at one bit of the painting, you looked at the whole thing at the whole time. And color field paintings, whether it was a Larry Poons or a John McLaughlin or Stella from New York, all shared this all at onceness. And I think there was a really weird parallel there which was going on in the broader society. First of all, the hippies of the 60s, the dope, the experiment, the arrival of the pill, the youth culture. And remember in 1960, two years after the Beatles did Sgt. Pepper and Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, where Apollo 11 is landing on the moon. And there was a sense of reaching for a kind of a space never before achieved that was, it didn't have faces in it, it didn't have landscape in a traditional way in it. It was out there, it was new, it was achievable by almost an act of faith, it was full of hope. And I think when I, when I was trying to think about the 60s, that's the mood I remember most. On the practical level, you had um, people buying raw cotton duck for, that were boat sales in Annapolis and Baltimore. <laughs> and that had allowed some of this great scale to be generated. And so it wasn't just that they were staining with new paints, but they were thinking big scale. And the idea of seeing things all at once, the heraldic, uh, really, we could get our faces up here now and, and go to the first Gene Davis uh, stripe, if we could, yeah. Uh, this one's not even in the show. I don't know where this came from, but uh, this is, um, can just stay there. Um, because yeah. anthracite, many anyway. titles are great. Um, Gene had said, Gene had said that uh, the way to understand his paintings was to enter through the, the door of a single color. And I think, from what we've all talked together, I think you enter the 60s through the door of Gene Davis. <laughs> because he was here, and he bounced off of everybody, and he taught, and um, he's a good index to what was going on. Jack? Well, I, I can tell you, as a student on the West Coast, uh, we were very interested in Gene Davis because we wanted to know what the code was because these couldn't simply be stripes. Yeah. So, so we try, okay, so red, uh, you know, red stands for R and orange stands for O or maybe it's the width of the stripes or, or uh, you know, there, but there has to be something going on here. And I told this story to uh, uh, E.A. Carmian and he gave me this uh, Great little story. Let me, let me just read this really quickly. Sometime in the later 70s, we hung the spectacular black and white Gene Davis in the National Gallery's East Building titled Satan's Flag. This was an era when certain schools, academies of art history were given to finding obscure meanings in all kinds of Western art from the Renaissance forward. One afternoon soon after, while talking with my staff, Eliza Rathbone and the late Trinket Clark, the absolutely joyful Trinket announced that in an instant of recognition and inspiration, she'd made a copy of the Gene Davis Satan's flag and was taking it to the Georgetown social Safeway and there to its new barcode reader. <laughs> she hopes 
Her hopes were that in running it through the reader, it might register something like Campbell's tomato soup or Tide detergent. Warhol had that. Yeah. Using this reading, she planned to write an art bulletin parody of hidden themes in Jean Davis. Depending on the read, again, say Campbell's t tomato soup, her parody would then, in best artistry style, discuss precedents in pictures of soup eaters, thus linking Van Gogh to potatoes, Van Gogh's potato eaters to Gene Davis and showing his hidden connections to Andy Warhol's soup cans. Unfortunately, the painting didn't scan. Right. <laughs> story. The good story, good story. Uh, back to this, uh, th this uniqueness of the city, and I think there were spiritual things and, and uh, practical things. The schools that were here have to be given credit for the influences they Just had. Just before we get to that, uh, about Jean, coming from this exhibition, not to say the paintings are monotonous, because they're not. If you understand them and look at them, it is not monotonous. But it is all of, of variations on a, on a single formal theme, uh, or approximately. There are a couple horizontal uh, stripes in there. Uh, but Jean is, so in a way, it's a wonderful exhibition, but it's ironic in a certain sense to be standing here talking about the 60s and Jean as an entry to it. He was, but in a kind of insidious way. Jean was much more than, he was a confident person and a confident artist and he, uh, but he wasn't an insecure person at all. And as uh, uh, John Kelly suggested in, in yesterday's wonderful article in the Post, he had a sense of humor uh, Jean, we're going to get to the, one of the events later, that towards the end of the, the uh, uh, sale of, of copies of Jean Davis, but that, we'll explore that, I'm sure, but I just wanted to say that Jean was much more. He was a teacher. Uh, he loved to talk about art. He was open to a lot of different ideas. He was extremely confident uh, uh, in himself, but at the same time was open to other things. And what uh, this conversation will be a lot about one way I interpret the 60s is that in a way the Washington Color School was over in a way uh, in 1965 when that show went up uh, labeling it as the Washington Color School and from that time on the story of the decade and in, many, in, in the art world here and in many other social aspects uh, and political aspects is, is dynamism and change and in terms of the 60s lasting beyond the 60s, that's very true. A lot of things that f came to fruition here in D.C. started in the 60s. It was, a, it was a germinating time. And so we'll see that as we discuss institutions and everything else. But Gene was, in a way, a part of that change. He even did the earliest video art. He did videos which were destroyed. But before anybody was thinking of it as a art medium. Yeah. Joseph Cornell, long before. Video? Yeah. Joseph Cornell? Well, movies. Oh, you know, no. So. And Juan Downey in the 60s yeah. here uh, right. really was a pioneer. Exactly. Maybe that too started in the 60s, but really came to fruition in the 70s. Yeah, he went uh, to New York from yeah. here. I was young in the 60s. It's hard to remember what it's like to that be That may young. not be the yeah. reason you don't remember. But I remember, I remember Gene Davis as someone that was just lit up by young people. He'd started out as a journalist. He'd worked on, in, during the uh, FDR administration covering the White House. He used to be in that, you know, play poker with the president. And then he got out of the daily newspaper business and went to work for the American Automobile Association putting out a magazine. It wasn't until the mid 60s that he was secure enough in his art business and selling enough art that he took a job teaching at the Corcoran. And his art, I think, brightened. I think 64 was his, you know, a great year for Davis. I think he just loved being around young people. And there is a kind of playfulness in his selection of color. Greenberg and Michael Fried and the thinkers, EA, and the thinkers who were writing that such thick and serious commentary and art forum about, about color field painting were not playing games. They were dead serious. 
Gene was very playful. When you asked him how he picked colors, he always dodged the question. And I remember that when he died, I wrote an obituary, and the last sentence, the kicker of this story was that he told me as a kind of canned response, he told it to me more than once, that as Emerson had once said, on the lintel of my doorway, I inscribe the one word, whim. And there is something in the Davises where the colors that he selects are completely unpredictable. And if you look for a code, you ain't going to find it. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. The whim uh, is what separates him from uh, the uh, whole Albert's tradition. Just, yeah. just I, because I, the CIA never cracked that code right. doesn't mean that it was not there. Uh, but back to the schools. I just want to get them in because uh, things were happening here. Early 60s, Kenneth Nolan was at, the, at Catholic U and they were showing only religious art until Ken Nolan began to show people like Gene. He gave him his first solo. And he showed Lewis. 62 is also the year Lewis died. So Lewis is pretty much out of the picture as of those early moments. And Nolan left that year. So that was a, a real kind of breaking point. And uh, um, at Howard you had master teachers that were there from the 40s. And, uh, uh, Melu Jones influencing people that now are uh, practicing, and uh, Alma Thomas went to AU, and they had this wonderful old history. She was a classmate of Alice Denny's. Yeah, Alice. <laughs> We're going to talk more about Alice. Um, and the Corcoran, of course, and it had an artist faculty that was wonderful, and through the 60s picked up people like Bill Christenberry and Newman, uh, Paul Reed taught there. So I don't want to neglect that or the point that you made, Paul, early to us that the museums mattered because we had not just high quality art here that anybody could see, but it was all free. And that had set high standards for the amateur, for the students, for anyone who went through the museum system of... Gene, let me just yeah. say it was, it was more than just going to the museums. From the days that Duncan Phillips started an art school on the third floor of their house on 21st Street so that our people could get his kind of French impressionist summarizing um, depiction of what was in front of them. That was transplanted whole to AU where now it's the center of showing this kind of art. The people that taught at the Corcoran meant that the, I'm thinking of Ed McGowan, I'm thinking of Gilliam, I'm thinking of Davis, we're hanging out with kids all the time and getting some of that energy that was happening in youth culture at the time from the, the kids. When these people weren't teaching in schools and there weren't that many jobs, what jobs were available for artists were often in the museums. Willem de Looper had been for years at the Phillips. You mentioned Sidney Lawrence. He was working at the Hirshhorn. Um, I remember meeting Mark Lighthouser, who is now the head of design at the National Gallery and a deputy director there and a man of high esteem and probity in Washington, when he was a hippie artist. And that th there was a sense that there were jobs for artists in the museums, the artists got to know the staffs in the museums, the curators, and the openings in Washington at the museums, the Corcoran primarily, were the, mo the most important social events where painters who spent a lot of their time alone in front of an easel or at least in a studio and curators from different museums and collectors and all the kids from the Corcoran School mixed together in these elaborately um, fun parties. Well, Berkowitz, of course, we forgot him. Yeah, Berkowitz. Uh, he was gone at the height, high moments of the color school. He was in Europe. When he came back, he said, hey, I'm not in the color school, I'm interested in light. Uh, he taught at the Corcoran for some years and he was beloved. And there's a, an image that I've always liked which showed all of his students who invaded a black tie opening uh, and, and sat beneath the big Tony Smith smoke. Leon Berkowitz might have said he was not part of the color school, but he never gave an interview that didn't have the visit to New York to see Frank Thaler right, right. as the lead. So he did. He, no, no, that's not true. Well, not to me, he didn't. He returned to <laughs> no, it all the he, time. No, no, Leon didn't claim that as part of his curriculum, but he did 
to give him credit, I mean, he was the real mastermind of the Washington Workshop Center for the sure. Art in the 50s, and he brought a lot of these people together, and his own evolution as an artist, uh, in a way, didn't depend on, on the color school. Uh, so, uh, I think well, I, thought, I think he was, he was a glad to ride on the, in, on the, in the draft of the color school later on and often talked about bringing Nolan and Lewis together at the Washington Workshop, going to New York. Anyway, he did with me. Well, he, and then working with, I, I, I don't know, I think there's a difference between what, right. uh, what uh, Leon did and the color school itself, but uh, uh, so when he of, got to his, what his, his mature and yeah. better, better paintings, uh, they had their own. They, they have their own spirit. Right. By the way, that's one thing when you talk, you mentioned Michael Fried and, right. on, and, and Clement Greenberg and, and the way that writing read was what one, they, one thing they excluded was the soul of, of the color, of color paintings. You can't, uh, to react emotionally to what's in those paintings, it isn't just technique, it isn't just form. There's something there to the best of them. And, and so there is a spirituality to Leon's that is different, say, from the elegance and the... Uh, dispassion. Of, well, I don't know, dispassion exactly for Morris Lewis, say, the unfurls, but it is a, a, a different kind of uh, emotional and spiritual experience. Let me just say the one thing about the schools. In those days, you could go in the basement of the Corcoran, and they still had, you know, um, plaster casts of Hercules and Venus and things were... They were on the staircase. They were on the, st well, on the staircase, but in the, in the school itself, for, for, you know, almost 80 years, the Corcoran had been teaching students how to draw the way students were always taught to how to draw. You start with the, mod with the plaster cast and you work from light models. This, for the first time, really, the kids that came to these schools were given abstract painting as a kind of a goal, devoutly to be wished, right from the get-go. And that happened with Nolan at AU. It happened when Davis was teaching at the Corcoran. And I would see st painters, I think particularly of Michael Clark, one of my favorite painters at that time, who came and could draw really well and very beautifully, and how he, w he discovered um, a lot of people discovered abstraction first at that time and then returned later in their careers to more traditional forms of depiction. I think and Michael Clark is a good example. Gene admired his very realistic facade paintings. Right. And then he eventually he became our pop <coughs> master. Right. Right. Uh, in in uh, 1969 or late 68, there was an exhibition I remember it very well, uh, of Michael Clark and uh, at the Corcoran, uh, Michael Clark, Ken Wade, um, oh, Newman, was it? Uh, Robert, Bob Newman, and, and uh, Michael, uh, they were all coming out of the Corcoran school with, and they were all abstract paintings with variations on a theme. Michael's, I remember very well, shaped canvases with, uh, uh, plays of, uh, in a grid. We have a picture of one of those. Is uh, Michael here? With the isometric perspective yes, at yes. 45 and, degree angles. Yeah. And, uh, and so that uh, Michael changed, the, it's part of the evolution that's going on here is that yes, the, uh, that was an interesting show especially because they were all young, they were just out of the Corcoran, they got a wonderful show taking the three uh, largest galleries, those uh, glorious series of galleries on the second floor of the Corcoran in the front, and four students, just graduates, uh, get to fill those spaces with abstract canvases. And each and every one of them uh, in the next few years evolved into something quite a bit more interesting than that. Okay, um, can we, we talk it, we about some it, people? We got it. Go ahead. Yep. I think you, you felt that some of the, the key elements are these moving forces. People who uh, were not artists, but uh, were generating excitement. And uh, well, I, I, we've got a list here. Alice Denny, Walter Hopps, Sue Green, James Herodas, Vincent Melzack. Uh, let me just put, up a, put in a word talk here. Talk about these people. Put in a word for Walter Hopps. Walter Hopps is the, was the antidote to Clem Greenberg. 
Walter Harps had a mind of the same unbelievably high quality, but he had a Catholicity of taste and an openness of mind that was the opposite of what you call Clem's exclusionary thing. When Washington, when the Washington Gallery of Modern Art, when Walter took the Washington care of the Washington Gallery of over, took it over, the first show he did was a, filled it with Gene Davis striped canvases, three floors or two, at least two big floors. The second was Ed Keenholz. The third was the protractor paintings of Frank Stella, another form of color field, one color at a time, geometrical painting. He had Billy L. Bengston thrown in there. Then the Harry Who out of Chicago. Walter believed there were many mansions in the house of art, not just this color field abstraction. And he opened the possibilities so that they included funk art, street art, hippie art, Film. amateur art, Films. and Films. The, the kind of dominant intellectual position of Clem Greenberg and Art Forum and Michael Fried and color theory and formalism was, I think, just broken apart by what Hobbes, and not only Hobbes, showed us. And I think if you think of those two things, you get a good sense of what was happening at the time. And all those people, whether it was Keenholz or Billy Al Bengston, had another kind of reaching out there. There was a lot of dope involved. There were, they, these people were as out there in both senses of the word. And the formalism, the rigorous academic stuff you get, makes you forget that Mary Meyer and Howard Maring and Noland were going up to Philadelphia to sit with a Reichian um, psychoanalyst in an orgone box and in, in absorb orgone and the, the sexual energy. They were getting centered. You could not they talk with Tom Downing without it getting very quickly to astrology. The Jonathan Meter, who was trained in silkscreen printing in the workshop that Walter started at the Washington Gallery of Modern mm. Art, made his best known picture of unicorns. There were um, outrageous ways of new, unfamiliar thinking that were flowing around the corners of the art world at this time. Also, remember, sculpture was almost invisible for some years there. Yeah. And uh, with Ed McGowan, uh, we suddenly said, okay, we can have uh, sculpture. He was doing the vacuum form plastics work and installation art he did. Well, so, there were sculptors in, in D.C. I mean, they, they were invisible. Even Anne Truitt, we didn't ever see a work by her well, in the 60s. Well, she's as much a painter as she is a sculptor. Yeah. Well, there, was, the, there were sculptors at AU. I mean, William Calfee was sure. showing a lot at that time. And, and there was an art world in addition to the right. uh, color school. And we, I'll just mention that, I mean, since this seems an opportune time to mention it, that the focus on the color school, the critical focus and the uh, money focus, the publicity, everything uh, left a lot in its wake. And it, uh, so it was important to get through that. And there was a lot of realist painting. I think there's always a lot of realist painting. I mean, there, it's the predominant mode of painting in, in every city. Uh, at, at all times, it seems to me, and uh, I would so bet on name, that. Name and, the, and name and, the people. Name who well, that would be. Uh, we Tisha. saw what's on here. Well, <laughs> yes, I mean. Joe Shannon. And well, uh, let's see. Woodward. Uh, Woodward. Bill Woodward oh. was was here. He was born in Washington, and unlike mo many of the artists that we're talking about, or uh, he was born in D.C. And uh, there was the. Uh, and, and worked here through the 60s and started showing here. In a, uh, uh, the, he had some uh, uh, association with American University. And American University at the beginning, uh, I mean, you had Robert Gates and... Uh, uh, Those are 40s, 50s people, though. Well, but not, but they're still painting. No, Robert Turista. Bob yeah. I, mean, I, I think you were absolutely right when you said that it came out of the Phillips. Uh, literally and figuratively, it came out of the Phillips. It was actually how the art department was actually housed at the Phillips during World War II, and then they came back, and La Watkins started this program, which you know owed a lot to 
post-impressionism, the post-impressionist kind of gesture and abstract expressionism, and that was a very different Way. kind of work than what was going on at the Corcoran, which, you know, a few years earlier, they were painting from plaster casts, and then all of a sudden, they had a hot, young faculty, whereas AUs was getting older at that time. So they, the kind of the faculties go back and forth, you know, depending on, you know, how many people have tenure, you know. Or, you Let know. me just say so, one thing about the difference, the sculpture painting, thing. Painting, sculpture always had second place in Washington. The National Gallery, and we're talking about the 60s, which is long ago, but the National Gallery might look like it's always been there. I'm older than the National Gallery. There are a lot of people in this room that are older than the National Gallery. It had a few sculptures in the hall, but it was a gallery of pictures. It did not have models of the Parthenon. It did not have suits of armor. It did not have Greek vases. It was a place where you went to see paintings. The Phillips had a, a sculpture in the back little courtyard, and it had a, a nice Alexander Calder bird made out of a coffee tin, chock full of nice coffee tin. But it, too, was a place where if you looked for art, you saw a two-dimensional painting. In Washington, sculpture belonged to the city and to the government. I think you could say the greatest art piece of art in Washington might well be the Lincoln and the Lincoln Memorial. But if you look at the statues of Washington, they belonged in the squares and they were of Civil War generals and they had a public ceremonial governmental tone to them. And painting had, was given a privileged position here, which I don't think it's ever lost. I think uh, that one of the things that did change here in Washington in a big way, and one of the form givers and movers and uh, moving spirits of the 60s it uh, would be high on my list is a sculptor uh, who helped redefine sculptor, Rockne Cripps. Yep. And uh, if you think about Rockne as a, a, a force for change in the art world, uh, uh, he basically his whole life was devoted to redefining sculpture as, a, as an environmental, as a truly uh, enveloping environmental uh, uh, experience, visual experience, he, he used and physical laser, experience. early laser. laser well, yeah, and, and, it, and it, the, glass the, as well. the Washington <coughs> Gallery of Modern Art is an interesting story, but it, it changed Washington a lot. I, I would just, in preparation for this, went over a list of shows that that just it was ama It's an amazing story, and it's a failure in a way. But it, the way in '62 when it opened. Uh, it went through a couple of phases. Alice was involved. Alice Denny was involved. Uh, the first director was Adeline Breeskin, who was a classic kind of uh, museum director. And the sh a show that I probably erroneously associate with her is, uh, is a wonderful exhibition of Vincent van Gogh, which was a, quite a thing to bring to Washington for this new institution. But right from the get-go they were showing uh, bringing really really fine art and change you couldn't see these people in washington friends klein was not you know and and uh picasso picasso but i'm talking about and, and, and uh pop artists uh uh the rauschenberg was there the whole crew of pop artists there was a whole show of that and that was before walter and then walter did when walter came uh he did introduce these wonderful things so but uh, just to emphasize that the, that institution, as an institution, is a very interesting study in Washington dynamics. Uh, it went through a few directors. You can kind of trace different shows to different ones. Hops was the last director. The, the institution was absorbed uh, for lack of money, basically. Uh, by the Corcoran and, and then disappeared basically after a while and it had, it had lasting effects but it had a dramatic impact on, uh, on DC as, a, as an awareness of, of uh, contemporary art and a place to actually see it. Um, Let me just tell you one little Walter story about this, about how he broke, how he expanded or he made acceptable different kinds of art. When he was hired to do the uh, American Pavilion at the San Paolo Biennale, he sent Barnett Newman. Barnett Newman is also behind those stripes upstairs, uh, as Albers is. He told Gene, though, that he was doing something fresh. 
Finn I Finn. heard him say it. Yeah. I heard Barnett Newman tell Gene not to worry about it. But he's going to do it something fresh. Right. But I remember once at the fag end of a, a art party, sitting in someone, standing in someone's kitchen with Walter and a few other people, drinking cheap white wine out of plastic glasses. And I said, you know, Walter, you were the first guy to show Duchamp, and you showed, uh, your Ferris Gallery showed War, um, Warhol out there, and you've given us all these things. What are the shows you would love to see that you never had a chance to do? And he said, he was thinking of a show called Seven Enormously Popular American Painters. <laughs> and this was a show that included Norman Rockwell, Rockwell Kent, N.C. Wyeth, Saul Steinberg, and Walt Disney. And these were all footnotes to the main um, act of the show, which was a two-person confrontation of Andy Warhol and John James Audubon. <laughs> okay. Uh, Abstraction was not the only thing we were talking about. At the Washington Gallery of Modern Art was also a, a woman named Sue Green, or Eleanor Green. Right. And uh, she went from there uh, to do, I think, freelance curating. But she curated a show at the Corcoran that was called Scale as Content in 1967. And it got the cover of Time magazine. The Tony Smith was on the cover. And everybody was just thrilled. It was like the kissing, the, you know, the blessing was here. It was called The Art Boom was the headline. Yeah. And, yeah. and the, the work that was on the corner out there was Barnett Newman's Broken Obelisk which you all know is the upside down point. And she tried to get anybody to buy it, to give it to the Corcoran, and people were, uh, did not, they felt it was a, a, a rude remark about Nixon and uh, others, that, that the, it was too close to the White House and it was saying that the Washington might, the world's upside down here. So of course, the Manil has it now, forever. Uh, so she was uh, always kind of a frustrated person in her last years. I used to talk to her and she was bemoaning the state of things. But she did have an impact. And, and Melzack, of course, was the collector who, um, who supported some of these people, especially Maring, and bought lots of their works and gave them to the Washington Gallery of Modern Art. And a lot of his works are now in this collection. And uh, he, he was in the famous fisticuffs with Jean Barrow, the Corcoran. So there were key events, if you wanted to have a timeline, uh, that we've not created here, but the, the Washington Color Painters Show, 1965. Uh, the Now Festival that Alice produced in 66 was crucial, but that was really New York, people coming down and showing us what was happening, Warhol and uh, others. And uh, 67, the Washington Gallery Collection was sold to Oklahoma. What was the name of it? The Arts Center of Oklahoma. And uh, this, this place opened in 1968 and was then the NCFA. And in 69 was the great giveaway. So we did want to get to the giveaway, but if you saw the John Kelly piece this past week, you, you saw Ed McGowan's take on that event, which was uh, kind of a send-off of the color school. And Jean was very much uh, agreeable to go along with that uh, uh, finish finishing off. Can I just say that these, we, I, it, sometimes we think is these as opposites, but they were blurred and blended in many ways. One of the things that Walter brought when he came here was the whole idea of conceptual art and the importance of Duchamp. And Gene Davis um, swallowed a lot of that. The um, Duchamp in the early years of the 20th century had made a famous piece he sold to Walter Ahrensburg called 50 cubic centimeters of Paris air. You were talking about the air of Washington. Gene Davis went in front of the White House during the Vietnam War and captured the air. The least successful of Davis's works, he did a thing with a few fingerprints, 10 fingerprints, one which wasn't his. Or I think the kind of trivial little micro paintings that are upstairs were really conceptual jests in a Duchampian way so even the most rigorous and loyal of formalist painters, of whom I think of Jean as one, were tempted every now and then by this playful, conceptual, um, jokey kind of, of activity. 
and the kids did a lot of it. Yuri Shrebler shaved all the hair off his body. Um, Ed McGowan changed his name legally every month for a year. And made a work with you know, each artist. Each you know, artist made a different work. You know, it took I, two, two, I think, t 26 months or something like that. Yeah, but it, it did legally go through with it. Every, and there, so this, this kind of activity um, was, it had an energy then. I wish he had been there. There really was an energy around art, an excitement, a belief that we were on the brink of a new future. Unspeakably <laughs> wonderful things were about to happen. And we haven't talked about P Street no. as a phenomenon. But if you I just want to that. say today, if you want anything equivalent, go to the kitchen. If you pick up the post now, there aren't any, there's not a lot of art criticism, but there sure is a lot of food reviews and the energy that young people have in cocktails. I, I agree with that. To paraphrase Frank Sinatra, at, in the 60s and early 70s at least, yeah. there was this excitement around. And uh, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. Right. In D.C., D.C., D.C. Right. And that was really the spirit, kind of uh, nose-thumbing optimism and ambition. It was uh, rare that we finally had a gallery street. We had a row that generated excitement, and that was the P Street phenomenon. And on that street were galleries we just should name. I mean, Ohm, Helm, how do you pronounce that? H-O-M? Hom. Jem Hom. Max Protech was there. Uh, Ari, Diane Brown. Uh, Pyramid was Ramon Osuna's, and he had Lowell Nesbitt. He showed Lowell Nesbitt plus Warhol and Cornell. Gallery Mark opened at the end of the decade, Mark Moyens. Uh, and Ari. And, and Jefferson Dorans. Place, yeah, those yeah. two. Oh, Jefferson so, Place was just off P Street. But when it, it then moved to it Peace moved to Peace Street, oh, it moved to Peace Street. Yeah. Yeah. Right. and and I think De Looper and the Washington Gallery of Modern Art was in effect on the, P Street. The yeah, as a matter of fact, that's that was the reason for Peace Street. It uh, it created that uh, uh, the fact that it opened in 1962 gave dealers an idea that we could have a concentration, and it gradually happened uh, happened when Henri moved in. 67, I'm, my colleague at the Star, Frank Getline, made a big, very funny uh, uh, to do about it. Uh, he said Henri that she should come across in, on a, in on, a boat from you know, Old Town. Henri crossing the, <laughs> the, 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 the Potomac. She was in yeah. that corner, that beautiful Victorian corner building. You remember she painted it purple? You remember that? But P Street was uh, for a while, and it, it stayed in the DuPont Circle area, R Street, but we called it the P Street Strip. And, uh, one of our complaints uh, was, at least mine, was that there was no really great artist bar in D.C. Uh, uh, the Benbow uh, was a good bar, but uh, it, you couldn't really call it. You didn't own it. Uh, P Street was, in a way, the gathering place for... You could go on a, on a weekday afternoon... Uh, you could see everybody you needed to see in a certain way, or you would. And on a Saturday, you, it was like a gathering of the art world, and you could uh, uh, step out and go to the Benbow or one of the restaurants and around. And when you went to the corporate openings, you saw the same people. Exactly. And we all saw all the shows. Because if you went down to see a show at Jefferson Place, all you did is cross the street, and there was Henri yeah. or, you know, Protect. And that... Those were, as you said, no bars. Herb White had not yet done his good artist bar work in Washington. <laughs> and it was, the P Street Strip was the, was the social sort of mixing place. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's important if you think of cities that have some particular energy. Famously, the Cedar Bar in New York, and you know, with fist fights and black, black turtleneck sweaters and no smiling aloud and gitan. <laughs> And when you think of Els Quatre Gats in Barcelona, where the young Picasso was able to go every day and meet the avant-garde kids back from Paris. And Paris, of course, had its own famous um, cafes back to the days of Toulouse-Lautrec and Montmartre. And um, that the, the strip was not a, the, they were galleries where art was sold. But you never felt the main business there was commerce in some way. Or, anyway, they didn't sell that much. Maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, I think uh, 
if you all feel we've kind of come to a yeah. point here, we'd be open to comments or questions from the audience for a little while. And the, there are mics on each side, I think. microphone. On each side. And identify yourself if you wish. You see the mic? First of all, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, it's been wonderful hearing you and seeing you again. Uh, I have one comment to make uh, that, uh, about Gene Davis. <coughs> uh, my, my name is uh, William Woodward. I used to be a young man here, and uh, there's a, we had something at American University called the Art Students Executive Committee, and we used to go to New York uh, to pick out new talent and bring it to uh, Washington and show it at the Watkins Gallery on the campus of, of uh, American University. We picked a, sh a painter named Gene Davis and gave him his very first show at the Watkins Gallery and, I, and he said to me and others, he said, uh, I, he just started painting. And we asked, well, uh, what made you want to be an artist? Because he used to be in, uh, he, he was rather late in life when he began. He said, I love Bonard at the Phillips Collection. And Bonard's paintings with his exquisite color made me want to become a painter. And he was not doing stripes in those days. He was using his fingers for a little, like as Bonard did many times, to apply this, uh, these wonderful jewel box uh, effects of, of color. And I think one other thing we should do is really congratulate uh, Alice Denny, who sp sponsored the Now Festival, that skating rink, and Rauschenberg came down, and it was a wonderful bohemian spirit that is sadly, uh, has sadly disappeared. But thank you for giving me a chance to say something. Thank you. Billy, I, I, we all here second that for Alice, thank you for doing that, because Alice, when you talk about movers and shakers, Alice was a shaker uh, of the Washington art world. And Mr. Rasmussen, who um, stays with us today, is, I would think, a Denny creature. <laughs> Definitely a Denny creature, yes. In some ways. She what? gave me a job when nobody else would. Thank I you, can. Alice. <laughs> thank you. One of the painters that I uh, didn't mention when talking about realism and f representational art in D.C., which really was one of the big stories of feelings of the, of the 70s, uh, an amazing flowering representational art. of uh, a, a, Just an amazing thing happened in the 70s. And most of these people uh, came early in the 70s or late in the 60s. But... One of the big events of the 60s, in my recollection of it, was uh, a show of Joe Shannon's that Walter put together at the Corcoran Gallery of, of, uh, of Joe's paintings, which uh, it's often said that Washington, and it's true, Washington doesn't have a lot of political art, and that's a whole separate discussion. But Joe's paintings were socially involved, uh, incredibly forceful, attacking, and yet sensitive uh, and very traditional paintings in a lot of ways, they, they were like uh, an announcement that something is going to happen here. And uh, so Joe is a, uh, a major figure, I think, in that. Uh, we, have a, we have one of his paintings in the loop. Should we just run that image loop and, and make comments as it goes? It goes pretty fast. OK, can we have that um, run? It's, it's a, as representative as we could get it with a, a number of really good artists. If we could have the, it starts with the color painters, it starts with the basic six and then goes on. Is there someone in the tech booth? So, <laughs> so why, why was there so little socially or politically engaged art in the 60s at a time when it was so much going on I well, mean, in this in country. Well, in Washington, unlike many in other cities, there was an institution that sort of sucked the political air out of the room. Could be. Yeah, if you were involved in painting, you wanted to get as far away. The, 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 the one exception to this is a very interesting story in and of itself. Mitchell Jameson, Mitchell yeah. Jameson. was a, Mitchell Jameson. who went to, was a World War 
too was it involved in the army's uh, effort to document with artists uh, the campaigns in Europe during World War II and uh, perhaps Asia too. I know the European part. Anyway, Mitchell uh, then goes back and in another a similar deal. He goes to Vietnam with the army uh, with freedom to move around Vietnam and hit and and devoted basically the rest of his life to this series of paintings and, and drawings about uh, Vietnam. And so that is one remarkable uh, exception to the rule here. Okay, the loop is going. There's mic there are micros. There are 12 of those upstairs that are actual canvases. These are plastic. The downing is very similar to what he was in the Whitney inaugural show, you know, um, and a horizontal downing. Uh, he's, they studied with Nolan. There's another one. That's the dials that are perhaps, and then Morris Lewis, of course. Uh, so these are the, the basic six of the first, of the 65 show. And the Mering, beautiful watery <laughs> Monet-like, and then the hard edge. I think, I'll see how he kind of went between the soft and the hard, and then more You can difficult. blame Clem Clement Greenberg for that. Yeah. yeah. He, he sent Mary real instructions, sir. Excuse me, Nolan. I think that painting, there was DuPont Circle and the square of the city and the river around it in one single room. Yeah, the, supposedly at Catholic U, they had some old Nolans and kids threw darts at them, but I don't think so. And then Paul Reed, of course, he was interested in color theory and he planned his. These were very much planned in a, kind of an Albers interest. Paul Reed, he's the last, he survived till two years ago, or till a year ago. And Benjamin Abramowitz, parallel, also in the geometry. And there's a Berkowitz with the light, the illumination. Yeah, yeah. and Clark. There's Clark's uh, geometric phase. Ah. And of course the famous drapes of Sam Gilliam. That's 68, and they filled the Corcoran Atrium, Hillary. He was the architect who did Henri's gallery, and then she gave him a show. Krebs with the lasers that were um, also out for the, yeah, Bicentennial McGowan and his vacuum plastic. Um, there's Mary Myers, where she was, the, you know, of course the victim of a murder and lover of Nolan and Kennedy. V.B. Rankin, who showed at Betty Parsons, Alma Thomas, whose work is in the White House dining room for the next few days. There it is. <laughs> Ann Truitt, and uh, she was the mother of minimalism, said, who, Greenberg may have said that. Ken Young is here tonight. Ken, yeah, Ken's Ken here, Ken where Young is he? Is here. Hello. Yeah, Yay. there you go. There we go. Okay. And there's the Joe Shannon, uh, the narrative paintings, and that was one of the few we could show, I think. <laughs> oh, can you stop and hold this? Uh, this one, this is, a, a, can't hold them? Okay. Uh, Red Grooms, of course, too young and did this in 86, but it, what it depicts is, it's called the pouring, as if it were some sacramental rite. It's <laughs> Morris Lewis doing a, a veil and people peeking to see what his technique was. He was very secretive yeah. about it. So it's Jean at the top, obviously, the, the bald head. The other two, unidentified, and I sent that to Downing's first wife and yeah. the Nolan Foundation. Those are not... They're just made up faces at the bottom. Here's Clark, he's now Clark V. Fox. He's just having a series of shows, uh, interest in him now. Biggs Museum, Dover, Delaware, this weekend, Saturday. And Robin be there, or be square. Here's DeLooper showing one of his works. He was the Phillips uh, guard who became there she the is. curator. The punk There's herself. There's Alice, yeah. And Downing, uh, so now come portraits of people, Franz Bader, and uh, Mary Swift took that picture, Franz Bader, and Gilliam by Paul Feinberg. Um, this was the same era as the drapes. Ari, very dramatic. Uh, and there's Ramon who had Pyramid Gallery and Walter. And this is Jefferson Place Reunion and it's not gonna stay there long enough, but Nesta's in the middle and Vivi and, well. Rocky. Yep. Canaan, Jacob Canaan was very important to throughout all of this, and Rodney, 
programs. And Morris Lewis, of course, has been gone. <laughs> Can I just say one last word? When I look back, I was thinking, as Ben was, you know, trying to remember back to the 60s and all the decades that followed, and thinking, you know, what was I right? Where was I wrong? What was most important to me in, let's say, that 50 years? And I think that we mustn't forget how fortunate we are in this city to have been had in our presence Paul Mellon. And I'm speaking not because he was a painter, but what he showed us, or what his institutions that he set up showed us over the years. We enjoyed Michael Clark and Gene Davis and um, Joe Shannon, but the Titians, the Leonardos, the Vermeers, the quality of the deep history of art, there's almost nobody in America that had such offerings within walking distance, which we had. And the, the artists that we've been speaking tonight belong to a much larger community of picture makers. And that community, even if, you know, the kitchen has taken over, was represented in, those, in this period, starting really in the 60s. In a way, um, it was nowhere else in America. And uh, I think we should all be grateful for it. Grateful for that. Patronage. We have people? Okay. Okay. Is this on? Yeah. Um, why is the color Speak scheme... Speak into the microphone. <laughs> why is the color school not optical art? Why well, it is. It is. I mean, in, in, uh, why if you go... Why isn't it talked about as part of the color school? Op art. Well, optical art, is, op art would be a, a kind of subgenre of, of color field painting. Uh, so I think it's a, a distinction without much of a difference. Well, there were people also that were playing games that wanted to do little perspectival games. What was the name of? Vassarelli. Vassarelli and, the, and that Jewish guy that, you know, painted the, the things. There were people Agam. Agam. There were people from um, Latin America. And this was, there are plenty of um, color field, Washington color paintings that do, do nothing op art really at all. Over here on the right side. Hello, my name is Nihal. Apparently, like Jean was, I'm a young journalist in town. Um, and I'm curious, it, it, from the names, again, I'm not familiar with many of them, but from the names, it seems like most of the um, influential major artists in Washington in the 60s were um, Caucasian or of European descent. I'm curious if there were any major artists or curators who were African American, East Asian, South Asian. Um, and second, what role the international community, perhaps embassies, uh, played in the art scene in, in the 60s? Uh, well, can I just say that, not that um, you're quite true, there was, this was a southern segregated city. There was a lot happening at Howard, maybe not in the 60s, but planted in the 60s and shortly thereafter. There's a terrific painter here in the room tonight, Sylvia Sloten, who is, who is studying at this time at Howard. There later... Lou Stovall studied Lou Stovall there, in the, and, and Franklin and, White as and, well. And Ken Young. And, and Ken Young. Martin there, Purrier. Martin Purrier started here. He's an African-American artist. And today, when feminism is also a form of you know, inclusionary political energy. One mustn't forget, we were talking about the Peace Tree Strip, Adeline Briskin, Henri, Nesta Dorrance, um, Alice Denny, how many women, Sue Green, how many women had power? You know, and when Washington had a tradition, uh, it, it, very unusual actually in the art world of the uh, 40s and 50s at the Barnett Aiden Gallery, which was founded uh, uh, in collaboration with uh, Howard University, and so and and that was a very uh, pioneering and ex that in lasted into the 60s too. Uh, yeah, and and it, and it set a tone here, so that Washington in the art world, although the uh, the wider community was uh, still very segregated, uh, during, especially during the early 60s. So that was a continuing fight. I mean, it was like living in a different time zone than the art world. But the art world itself had this tradition of uh, 
integration and of making, uh, uh, it was the art that counted. And so I think that uh, in Washington there was a, an, uh, a, a great presence of, of uh, African Americans and people of color. Uh, there, the, the demographics of Washington have changed a lot, but, uh, the, uh, but uh, Ramon Osuna, for example, coming from Cuba was a very influential dealer. Juan Downey from uh, Chile uh, started here. Uh, well, he lived here for quite a, a while. And uh, so Washington was a very unusual place, I think. And when you think respect. of people like Franklin White or Martin Purrier or Sam Gilliam who were showing at that Peace Street strip, <coughs> The fact that these people had dark skin was not what we talked about at the time. It was not an identity politics kind of situation. It was their art that got them into Henri or Jefferson Place or the Corcoran. But it's interesting that, that uh, the evolution of Howard, when we talk about not political, no political art in Washington or the, uh, not a whole lot of it, uh, Howard evolved in this early 60s to an extremely socially conscious uh, and uh, aggressive kind of political, social art. Uh, the uh, Afrikoba uh, movement, Jeff Donaldson there. So that was percolating in the 60s as well. I think but, if, you, if you were to see our book <laughs> and you flip through, you will see a, a nice mix of colors and faces through the, through the decades, even in the 40s when Eleanor Roosevelt would go over to the Barnett Newman, uh, that, kind of establishing that that was maybe the avant-garde thing to do. The but, international uh, side of that, I think the most influential uh, aspect of that in Washington that I recognized uh, even at the time was, was the Latin American uh, uh, exhibitions at the Pan American, then called the Pan American Union. Yeah. But every, oh, yes. they, they wrote, it was rotating exhibitions from various South American and uh, Latin American countries. And so uh, throughout the 60s and 70s uh, and on into the 80s, uh, there was a very good exposure of, of Latin American art oh, here. Over here? Uh, yeah, my name is Perry Frank. Um, Um, I have been working for a long time on documenting the public art in Washington, meaning the outdoor murals that have really uh, come throughout the city and actually throughout the urban scene all over the country. Uh, actually, the first ones done in this city in the uh, late 60s were uh, at Howard University. Mm -hmm. But um, you're talking about the lack, that there isn't as much energy maybe now in the idea of the new and so forth. But I do think that the public art in Washington now and throughout the country, but in Washington, it has its own ethos, is very exciting. Uh, I think one of the things that I picked up on was your discussion of Duchamp. I think that a lot of the street art that we have is conceptual art, uh, drawing from art of the absurd. Um, it varies in quality. Some of these murals are really terrific art, um, but they are very important art to many people in the city, to the neighborhoods, and I just wondered if you guys have any comments on that. I have more questions than comments on it, really, because I would ask you if, if you see in the Washington murals a, uh, a what to what do you attribute its variety, and uh, uh, if you see a consistent uh, thematic uh, uh, well, input. They they have varied. Um, the the street art phenomenon mm -hmm. came a little later. Uh, the the earliest ones really to get attention were the Latino murals in, in Adams Morgan. And, can, uh, can we cut off in that that's not about the 60s? Is that okay? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, yeah, because we've got right people there. waiting and we're supposed to have been sure. through five minutes ago, if you don't mind. Can we go over here? Thank uh, you anyway for that. I'm Annette Poland. I first want to thank you all for um, this wonderful evening. But I just want to mention before you leave the Corcoran Conference in 1972 on women in the arts because 
there were a lot of really great women making art here, and they weren't represented in any of the museums. And galleries disproportionately showed them. So uh, that conference, um, and I think Mary Beth Edelson, exactly. I think there were a group of Rosemary Wright, there were, there were a whole lot, but the a group of women who got women Barbara artists Frank. and curators and activists from all over the country to uh, come here and create a real community. I think that women were, were one of the trends that we see emerging at the end of the 60s. Right? Was over here somebody? No, that no. is the last question. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Good. Thank you.